Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lisa Fauci, I'm the current president of SIAM. I'm coming to you from my home in New Orleans, Louisiana. And today um, we are going to have uh, a presentation by the 2020 John von Neumann Prize winner. This prize was established in 1959 and honors John von Neumann, a founder of modern computing. The prize is awarded annually for distinguished contributions to applied mathematics and for effective communication of these ideas to the community. The 2020 Siam John von Neumann Lecture Prize is awarded to Nick Trefethen in recognition of his groundbreaking contributions across many areas of numerical analysis. Nick is professor of numerical analysis and head of the numerical analysis group at Oxford University. He was educated at Harvard and Stanford and held positions at NYU, MIT, and Cornell before moving to Oxford in 1997. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and served as president of SIAM in 2011 and 2012. He has won many prizes, including the Gold Medal of the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications, the Naylor Prize of the London Math Society, and the Polya Prize for Math Exposition from SIAM. He is an outstanding expositor of applied mathematics, and his books are beautifully written, widely accessible, and highly original. I know many of you out there in, in the cloud right now have learned numerical linear algebra from his textbook with Bao or have taught from it. So it is my great pleasure to turn this over to our 2020 John von Neumann Prize winner, Nick Trefethen. Thank you, Lisa. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm across the ocean in Oxford. And um, I guess I first want to say uh, how much it means to me as a, a member of the Siam family all these years to win this prize. So um, I, I joined Siam, I think in 1978, and um, I was looking at the list of previous von Neumann winners, and I think I've been at 30 of the lectures over those years. So about three quarters of them I've actually seen. And I have um, memories of the good ones, of the bad ones, and uh, this has been a part of my life over all these years. It's just amazing, the honor to be one of these people myself now. So uh, thank you, Siam, who have been so important to me over the years. And I, I wanted to say a particular further thing about Siam. Um, as most of you know, perhaps, Jim Crowley has been the executive director of Siam for a very long time. It's approaching 30 years, not quite there. And Jim is retiring this year. Uh, many of us can't imagine Siam without him. It, it's been a, a very well-run, successful organization, really for generations, growing, publishing more and more journals, having more and more conferences. It's just amazing how successful and now international Siam has been. So Jim has been absolutely at the heart of that. And uh, good luck, Jim, if you're listening, uh, we all wish you well. It's just an amazing thing that after all these years, we're going to lose you. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about rational functions, as you can see. And you can see from the uh, table of contents there that the plan is, as usual with me, to mix a bit of history, a bit of philosophy, a bit of mathematics, and a bit of MATLAB. So let me begin that process. First of all, I want to show you, I think, a complete collection of all the people I've written papers with about rational functions. Uh, and it, it's been fun to collect this list and realize what extraordinary people these are. I won't go through all the names, but uh, I'm sure many of you are watching. Thank you all. I'm sure many of you know these people. I will mention the top row because they've been so important to me in the past and presently. Um, Martin Gutknecht and Jean-Paul Beru were the two people who, as 
much as anyone, got me involved in rational functions right at the beginning of my career as a graduate student. And uh, Martin is still the person I've written the most papers with. And I think Jean-Paul is the person I've written the most successful paper with. Um, and more recently, I've been working a great deal with Andre Wedemann and Yuji Nakatsukasa. And in particular, during these very weird last three or four months, my central project has been with them, working on rational functions with Andre and Yuji. So we have exchanged hundreds upon hundreds of emails in the last three months. Okay, uh, let me move on. So I want to make a few remarks about rational functions and their mathematical place. So it turns out that in my career, I have made exactly two logos. These are my two logos. Cheb Fun is one of them and uh, Toby Driscoll and maybe Nikhail and I designed that logo one day in my office about 15 years ago. And the other logo is for lightning PDE solvers, which we designed about a year ago with Abhigopal. These are two bits of work that have been very important to me. And I realize now, it, it wasn't the point originally, but I realize now that the, the first of them represents many years of my life working on numerical methods based on polynomials. And now I'm more and more focused on rational functions for reasons I will explain. If you're thinking as a theoretical mathematician, you could make the observation that polynomials are rational functions, of course. They just have all their poles at infinity, whereas rational functions, the poles might be anywhere. Now, if you look at the role of polynomials in mathematics, it's very hard to overstate how important they are. They are absolutely at the beginning of everything and still there in the middle of everything. Whatever subject you look at, polynomials are important. The field of analysis, you could say, more or less started. Newton was an expert at using polynomials. Complex analysis, more specifically, is based on convergent Taylor series. It's all about polynomials and their limits. But then algebra, a very different part of the mathematics, is also very much focused on polynomials. That's the starting point and still very central, multivariate polynomials. It would be hard to find a topic in mathematics more central than polynomials. If we look at rational functions, the situation is different. I certainly would not claim they have the same kind of fundamental role in mathematics. And the reason I'm so interested in them is I think they have and potentially may have a very great role in applied mathematics and computation. You'll see this stuff in action during the course, during the talk, but just to summarize why rational functions have a special power. Well, they're very good at behaving, at resolving things near singularities and also beyond singularities, by which I mean extrapolation, analytic continuation, locating poles, going around poles. And they can go all the way to infinity, unlike polynomials, which are forced to be infinite at infinity, rational functions can get there. Just to say one more word about the logo. This wasn't in our minds as we designed them, but the Chepfun logo, you'll notice, has this uniform property. And that's what polynomials are. They, they don't prefer one part of the plane to another. They're everywhere. Rational functions have this pointed property. They zoom in, they focus on one or two special regions of interest. That's why they're important. So the logos end up capturing something about why these things are interesting. Now, the talk is gonna be entirely about scalars. Although these days, vectors and matrices are amazingly important. I'm in the midst of a uh, mini symposium today, which will continue later on with some very exciting mixes of scalar and matrix rational function ideas. Uh, relatedly, though not quite the same, I'm going to talk about one variable. So I'll be in on the real axis or in the complex plane. But of course, multivariate problems are also important. So let me say a word about polynomials in numerical analysis, that's my field. I won't go through line by line, I'll just show you a list of some areas 
where polynomials are usually not just there, but actually the foundation. If you talk about interpolation and approximation, you start with polynomials. Quadrature formulas, root finding, optimization, finite difference methods based on local polynomials, spectral methods based on global polynomials, Chebfun, a software tool, which is a continu the continuous analog of MATLAB. If you look at the polynomials in this picture, they're all over the place. Some of them are of a very low degree. And in particular, optimization, one could say, is essentially founded on a degree two polynomial. Uh, variations on the theme of Newton's method are the starting point of this field to find the minimum of a function. Why degree two? Because the process is iterative. You're not fundamentally, usually, trying to make a global model of a function, but to find a special point. And because of that iterative nature, low degrees are very central. At the other extreme, if you look at root finding, one of the coolest ways to find all the roots of a function is with a global polynomial. Uh, and that brings in eigenvalue calculations for matrices. So polynomials of degrees from two to two million are interesting. But this talk is about rational functions. And the thing about rational functions as they exist currently is that not so often are they used in an explicit manner on the fly. Often they're lurking behind and not so conspicuous, but still important. For example, almost anything you do with a discrete formula for solving an ODE has a rational approximation somewhere in the picture. Infinite impulse response digital filters are all about rational approximations. Matrix iterations have fascinating aspects of rational approximations. Even from the beginning, Rutishauser was thinking in those terms. Martin Gutknecht is a great expert on these things. Whenever you do a Lanchos process, you're implicitly constructing a Pade rational approximant to a certain resolvent. Indeed, more generally, anything you do with matrix eigenvalues numerically, the polynomial methods were discarded 50 years ago. They're too slow. The fast methods zoom in on eigenvalues, and that has something to do with poles being strategically located near those eigenvalues. Functions of matrices are famously computed often with rational approximations. Acceleration of convergence of series is most of the famous methods are based upon Pade rational approximation. I should say what Pade means. If you have a function at a point, you can, if it's analytic, you can talk about its Taylor series and the Taylor polynomials are truncations of the Taylor series. Well, Pade rational functions are also approximations to a series at a point. But instead of truncating the polynomial, you find a rational function that matches that series to as many terms as possible. So Pade is the rational generalization of Taylor. If you want to find poles or do analytic continuation, rational functions are the main technique. In the field of quadrature, it's very beautiful. Every formula, every classic quadrature formula is equivalent to a rational approximation. That connection was implicitly used by Gauss when he invented Gauss quadrature, but then the people who made it famous in the numerical era are Takahashi and Mori um, back around 1970. And then maybe the biggest growing field on this particular list would be the more the linear algebra side of things, model order reduction, control systems, rational approximations are everywhere. Continuing with my history and philosophy and the parallels between polynomials and rationals. As many of you have heard me speak on the subject that computing with polynomials has not such a great history. Most of the 20th century thought that this was difficult. I wrote an essay on this called Six Myths. Um, I think in the era of Cheb Fun, perceptions have changed a bit. It's been appreciated that with the right algorithms you can do pretty much anything with polynomials. Let me say why. There are various reasons why polynomials have given troubles, but I think the central one is that 
the obvious definition of a polynomial is numerically dangerous. So of course, we think of a polynomial as a linear combination of monomials. And of course it is that mathematically. But if you try to compute like that, you're in trouble usually, unless you happen to be working on the unit disk. The problem is that on almost any domain, these powers will vary exponentially from one part of the domain to another. That leads to exponential ill conditioning. So if you try to do anything in the monomial basis of degree 60 or more, it will probably fail. When you think about that clearly, it's not such a deep matter, but of course, over the years, people haven't always thought about it as clearly as one would like. There are various solutions to the problem. You can use orthogonal polynomials, which you can compute on the fly with the Stilchus process, also called Vandermond with Arnoldi. Uh, you can use barycentric representations, which I'll say more about. Now, what about rational functions? Computing with them has been even worse. Uh, it has certainly not been part of the mainstream toolkit for most people. Maybe that's beginning to improve, but there's a long way to go. I think the fundamental reason or a fundamental reason is beautifully parallel. Of course, we all know the standard definition of a rational function. And of course, mathematically, that's correct. It's a quotient of two polynomials. I'm not saying anything about how the polynomials are represented. I'm just saying a quotient of two polynomials. Well, even if you represent P and Q with perfect orthogonality, this quotient is still numerically dangerous. It has exponential ill conditioning in the interesting cases. And the reason is that in the cases we most care about, P and Q, will tend to vary exponentially over the domain of interest, even though their quotient doesn't. So even if you're doing your polynomials perfectly, representing a rational function as a quotient of them is asking for trouble. That's one of a number of reasons why people have had difficulty over the years. And again, there are solutions, not to everything, but you can get a long way with orthogonal bases, I'm not telling you any details. There's something called rational Arnoldi. And there are other representations we will say a little bit more about. But I want to make a few more editorial remarks about rational functions. If you look at what people have paid attention to over the years, it's not been very practical and very numerical on the whole. There's too much fascination with minimax approximation. I too am fascinated, but that's not the way to most computational ends. There's too much fascination with Pade approximation, which is at a point. Imagine if numerical analysis of polynomials were all about Taylor series. Of course it's not. Well, similarly, rational functions shouldn't be all about Pade. In general, there's an enormous amount of theory and not a corresponding amount of practice in rational computation. I hope this will change. So that's the end of my introductory remarks. Now, the mathematical part of the talk has two main parts. First of all, I want to talk about constructing rational approximations whose poles might be anywhere. And the method I will emphasize is called AAA approximation. And then I want to talk in the next part about uh, fixing the poles at particular locations. So, First of all, I want to talk about this algorithm we call AAA. Uh, it's implemented in CHEBFUN, which runs in MATLAB. So CHEBFUN is the, the world's preeminent example of an open source software system written in a non-open source language, uh, to many people's regret, but there we are. I'm going to begin by demonstrating and then explain to you something about what's going on. So I'm now going to execute these commands that you see in front of you. Um, Lisa, I see you're there. I hope you or somebody will warn me if this doesn't work. Good. I didn't hear you, but I saw your thumb go up there. So I'm now talking to MATLAB. And in the last four months, MATLAB is the creature I've spoken to more than any other. And I'm going to execute these commands. So for example, suppose I construct 
2,000 random points in a square in the complex plane, like that. Now let's plot those points. So I will plot the points in the complex plane. So that's 2,000 random points in a square in the complex plane. And we're now going to do a rational function approximation of a function evaluated on those 2,000 points. So the function will be the square root of z. I've just evaluated that at 2,000 points. If you think about the function, you know that on the computer, it has a branch cut along the negative imaginary uh, real axis. None of those points, cross, the points don't cross that branch cut, but it's there on our computer. Now let's do a rational approximation using AAA. So I'm going to compute a rational function, and I'm curious to know its poles, so I'll ask for its poles also. And I'll say r comma pole equals AAA of f comma z. So notice it very quickly in a small fraction of a second did whatever it does. r is a function handle to a rational function. Pole is a vector of poles. Um, Let's plot the poles as red dots a little thicker. You see that beautiful string of poles accumulating at the origin. The AAA algorithm doesn't know any mathematics, it just does what it does. But it has evidently found that having poles clustered near that point is a good strategy for approximating these 2,000 point values. You and I know that the branch cut for the square root on our computer lies along the real axis, but AAA has not done that. It has bisected the angle and put the poles at 45 degrees like that. It's an excellent approximation. For example, if I take any number in the square and evaluate R at that point, I'll get about 14 digits of accuracy. So the square root of one is one. What if I try the square root of four? Now, here I'm evaluating the rational approximation far away from the region where it was constructed. You see, I still get about six digits of accuracy. What if I evaluate it at minus four? So this is a rational function that approximates the square root. You see, uh, that's not what I expected. Sorry, I intended to do. Uh, what? <laughs> Something is surprising me there. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, maybe my random points were different from usual. <laughs> Usually I get more digits of accuracy in the approximation of 2i. Uh, here we seem to have about two digits. Usually I get five or six. With random numbers, you, you can't count on them. That's random numbers for you. <laughs> uh, let me now plot a phase portrait. So this idea of a phase portrait means colors indicating the phase of each point. And the man who's made these famous is Alias Weggert from Germany. Uh, and I have a little MATLAB command that I've called Weggert. And it gives you the phase portrait. And here you see a very common aspect of rational approximations. They are approximating a branch cut. You see from the picture, it's clear that the function has a numerical branch cut along that 45 degree line. Let me do one more case. I, let's plot those points again. And let's do a different function. Let's say f equals the square root of z times one minus z. So this function has two branch points at zero and at one. And let's again compute the AAA approximation. And let's again plot the poles. Isn't that beautiful? You see how the poles have curved around from one singularity to the other. And of course, we can look at the face portrait. And again, that's very beautiful. Okay, that's the end of this demo. Now, I want to say a, a word about what AAA is and what mathematics it plugs into. This gets back to the problem that 
the obvious representation of a rational function is not a good one numerically. So the first representation is that obvious one, P over Q. Of course, the advantage is mathematically, it's uh, very simple. And the disadvantage is that it breaks down when the poles and the zeros are clustered. And in the cases we care about, the poles and the zeros are clustered. That's why rational functions are powerful. If your function is so smooth that it doesn't need clustered poles and zeros, then you could probably use polynomials anyway. Representation two is what I'll call partial fractions. So here we have a linear combination of simple poles. Now, of course, that representation doesn't quite cover all rational functions. They might have double poles or triple poles, um, but that's a detail that for most numerical purposes, we can ignore, not all. This has some big advantages. It's very simple again. It leads to good linear algebra problems. And moreover, you can control where the poles are if you specify them in good places. It's also easily parallelizable, embarrassingly parallelizable. For big applications, that can matter. A disadvantage is that the conditioning, although much better than the quotient, still isn't perfect. But this is a very powerful representation, and it's the one that I think has been used the most in successful computing with rational functions. And it leads to the lightning PDE solvers we're going to talk about in the next part of the talk. The third representation is the barycentric one. So this is interesting. It's a quotient of partial fractions. So instead of representing R just as one sum of poles, you represent it at, as a sum of poles divided by another sum of poles, but always the same poles. So these points Z sub K are not poles of R, they're what we call support points. They look like poles, but they aren't poles. It turns out that these representations are fabulously stable if you choose the support points well. That's the most stable method known. Uh, it's not the most flexible. You have to do clever things to use this. You can't control where the poles are in a direct fashion with this method. That's good from the point of view of powerful approximation. It's bad if you want to make sure that none of your poles lie in certain regions. And it's this method that leads to AAA. I want to mention a theorem. The theorem is that unlike the partial fraction representation, this one really covers them all. Every rational function can be written in this barycentric form. That's not just true for some set of support points, it's true for any set of support points. So mathematically speaking, instead of working with rational functions in this form, we could in principle pick a set of support points and then use this form. Now, oh, I didn't mention there are other representations. Um, one of the leading figures in this business is Stefan Gutel at uh, Manchester. Um, and another, the, the group uh, Antulas and Guergen and um, other people working with them, it's also very important. And they have other methods of representing things which borrow some of these features, but not all. And Antulas is very interested in what's called the Loewner framework, which is another related method. There are many good representations here. Here's a bad representation, continued fractions. I'm not aware that that's important for numerical computation. Now, the AAA algorithm. This was um, something created essentially four years ago when Olivier Sett was visiting Oxford and Eugene Nakatsukasa was there. And the three of us spent months and months trying many, many, many different things together. The kind of research that is, has been impossible in the last four months because none of us are together the way we were here. Eventually it led to an algorithm which has just amazed us with how well it works. It's in this barycentric mode. And what it does, is summarized by these four points. First of all, it's a barycentric interpolatory mode, which means that we don't let the A's and the K's be independent. The A's are always going to be a function value times a B. So we're in the mode where the rational function is forced to interpolate at N points. And the way it works is it's a greedy algorithm where one after another, 
you choose the next support point, and then you solve a linear least squares problem. To choose the next support point, you find the place where the error is the biggest. And then the linearized least squares problem is you want to approximate rational f by irrational, but you multiply through by the current denominator to make that linear. So you solve this linearized least squares problem, which of course is easy. And then you iterate that. And for reasons that even now we don't fully understand, this turns out to be really a remarkably fast and stable and accurate method in most cases. Not all cases, it can fail. So an important theoretical question would be to find a variant on this algorithm that could be guaranteed to converge. Anyway, this is what we do, and this is what was done in those demos you saw a moment ago. So as I say, it's kind of amazingly fast. Typically, it'll give you an approximation within a factor of maybe 10 of optimal. And what makes it numerically so stable is that the support point Z sub K, which mathematically could be anywhere, tend to cluster near the singularities. And although mathematically that doesn't matter, from a stability point, it's crucial because it eliminates that exponential variation over the domain, which leads to trouble. And there are many interesting methods um, that already exist. I mentioned the Loewner framework, very important. Uh, there's uh, vector fitting is another very important method. There's a lot of powerful stuff out there, but somehow the AAA approach seems to be just faster and slicker than the others. That's a completely unbiased opinion. I wanna say a word about what we saw in the demo where the poles converge towards the singularity. There's a famous theorem in approximation theory by Donald Newman of Temple University in 1964. He proved that if you approximate the absolute value function by rationals on the unit interval, then unlike polynomials, which converge very slowly, you get exponential convergence or more precisely root exponential. So you get convergence at a rate exponential to the minus a constant times the square root of the degree. Now that in, in practice is fantastic. It means you can get six or eight digits of accuracy with just degree 50, say. So that, that was an, a remarkable result. And it turns out the same applies much more generally for more or less any problem with branch point singularities at one or more points a fixed number of points, you don't want 100 points, but three or four is fine, you'll get this root exponential convergence. And it's that fact that we're going to leverage in a moment. The proof, well, here are some names. The experts in this field, um, with a few exceptions, have links to the Soviet Union. Uh, Walsh was before that stuff, but Gonchar, Rachmanov, and others are the real experts in um, using these methods to prove results related to Newman's result. I wanted to point to a key aspect of that theory. It all comes down to the Hermit integral formula. Whenever you do all sorts of things in numerical analysis, contour integrals are how you estimate things. And the Hermit integral is a contour integral that estimates accuracy of rational approximations. From there, it turns out that if you interp interpret your poles as charges of one sign and interpolation points as charges of another sign, then rational approximation becomes closely related to potential theory. Absolutely beautiful stuff. It starts with Walsh and Runga, actually, but then Gonchar and Rachmanov and others made this sing starting in the 1960s and 70s. So there's some truly beautiful mathematics there that I won't go into further. Let me instead show you pictures of root exponential convergence. So here we have three different approximation problems, minimax approximations. I'm plotting the error as a function, not of n, but square root of n. So these straight lines are root exponential convergence. Here we're approximating x log x on the interval zero to one. Here we're approximating x to the one over pi on that interval. 
And here we're approximating the square root of z plus one on the unit disk. So very clean root exponential convergence. And the poles cluster exponentially at the singularity. You see on a large scale in every case, the poles are getting very close to the singularity. Let me finish this part of the talk by doing another demo. So I want to show you how these AAA free pole approximations represent conformal maps with amazing efficiency. Another um, theoretical observation here. These curvy branch cuts that we have already seen and we're about to see more of, the theory of that starts with Herbert Stahl. And he proved wonderful results showing that uh, Branch points, uh, sorry, poles of rational approximations tend to cluster along lines that have a structure related to capacity in the complex plane. So let me do this demo now. Suppose I say F comma F inverse equals a code I've got whose details I won't talk about to do conformal mapping. And I'll ask for a conformal map of an L-shaped region. And we all know about the L-shaped region from Cleve Moeller. It's the original MATLAB problem. Uh, so here we are. We've just done a conformal map of this region onto this region. But the remarkable thing is that the, the map is represented by a rational function computed with the AAA algorithm. And it's two different rational functions. From left to right, it's a rational function with 33 poles. And from right to left, it has 59 poles. These functions represent the conformal map to about seven digits of accuracy with really spectacular efficiency, 33 poles. That you can evaluate that in 10 microseconds on a computer. So it's just a whole new way of getting fast representations of conformal maps. If I type Vegert, you can see some pretty pictures. So there's the, uh, the branch cut in that conformal map. Let's get through a couple more and go back to the PowerPoint. Um, suppose I evaluate F of one. I've just evaluated the conformal map at a point. Suppose I evaluate the inverse at the point we just computed. Well, that matches one to about seven digits of accuracy. So you see these rational functions of low degree are really capturing the rational, the conformal map to 70. Let's get to a couple more examples while we've got it here. If another built-in demo is the isospectral drum shape. So here we're computing that conformal map. And again, the point is AAA rational approximations represent this to seven digits by rational functions of degrees 53 and 67. We also have a mode where if you give it a number, it makes a random polygon with that many vertices. Or if you give it a negative number, it makes a random circular polygon with that many vertices. So in every case, it's a AAA approximation compactly representing a conformal map. Okay, the other mathematical part of the talk has to do with fixing poles and what we call lightning PDE solvers. So the idea here starts about two years ago. We know that Newman and all this theory says that you can approximate functions with root exponential accuracy. And then we have this wonderful AAA algorithm. So the thing was, how about using that to solve Laplace problems and other problems? which are gonna have corner singularities. So let's use that rational approximation. It's not obvious how to do that. First of all, AAA is not reliable enough. You can't be sure that it won't put a pole in the domain where you'd like to have a harmonic function. Secondly, we don't know how to do it at all for harmonic as opposed to analytic functions. So we were at NYU, Abhigopal and I, speaking with Kirill Sirk and he, suggested, since we know the poles should cluster exponentially at the singularities, why not just put the poles there? And 
then the problem becomes linear. If you specify the poles, you get a linear approximation problem, which you can solve with backslash. So basically, I spent the last two years working on Kirill's idea, um, working with Abhi Gopal first and Pablo Brubeck more recently, and then in these last few months, related things with Eugene Katsukasa and Andre Redemar. So here's the idea, and this, first of all, you can see the logo there. So on the right, you see a picture of the Shard building in London being struck by lightning. And you also below it see the picture that's produced if you run this, our code, Laplace, with those three vertices specifying the corners of a triangle. The point of the expression Laplace, a lightning Laplace solver, is that it's using the singularities mathematically, which are the reasons that lightning strikes buildings at sharp corners. So it's not just fast, it's actually related mathematically. So the idea is we're given a Laplace problem on a region with corners in a plane. And what we're going to do is approximate the solution by matching the boundary data using linear least squares. And we're going to match the data by a rational function, or more precisely, the real part of a rational function. So our rational function will be dominated by this, the Donald Newman term, if you like, which will have six poles exponentially clustered near the corner. There's also a polynomial term included to grab, as it were, the smooth part of the problem. You can prove that these expressions have the power to approximate your solutions uh, with root exponential convergence. If you get such an approximation, you immediately have an error bound because of the maximum principle. You also immediately have the harmonic conjugate. So this is a way of solving Laplace problems that also gives you the harmonic conjugate. It's a variant on the idea of the method of the fundamental uh, method of fundamental solutions, which is an old one. Uh, here are some of the people over the years who worked on that, but there are many more. I learned a lot of these things from Alex Barnett at the Flatiron Institute. Timo Betke, my former student, now at uh, uh, UCL, works with him. It's not quite the method of fundamental solutions, though, because the exponential clustering is at the heart of the idea. And also we're using poles instead of logarithmic point charts. There's also a lightning Stokes solver. And the way that works is it's the same idea, but you use what's called the Gursa representation, which reduces biharmonic equations to pairs of analytic functions. So any biharmonic function can be written in this form. That goes back to 1898. Uh, it hasn't been used that much numerically, but it turns out it's a nice way to apply these ideas. And that's with Pablo Brubeck. We're working on that paper. Uh, the lightning Helmholtz solver is the generalization to the Helmholtz equation. So there, instead of Laplace, you add in a multiple of u. And this is what arises in acoustics and other areas where you have scattering, for example. And here, instead of a rational function with poles, you want something more complicated involving Hankel functions. And we haven't developed a theory on this that's in the future still, but it's clear from numerical experiments that it works. I think I will, my final demo will look at these things. Let me run these codes for you. So the Laplace code is one that we've been working on for the last year, really, to speedily solve Laplace problems in planar regions. So as always, there's an L option for the built-in L-shaped region. So here we've solved for a default choice of boundary data, the Laplace equation in this domain. And you can see, here's the important curve showing the root exponential convergence. It's a straight line plotted against the square root of the number of degrees of freedom. So let's, the default tolerance is six digits. Let's change it to 10 digits. So now you can see still this 
nicely straight convergence as a plotted as against the square root of the number of degrees of freedom. It's still less than a second to compute the 10 digit accurate solution to this Laplace problem. And the result is a rational function with on the order of 100 poles. Uh, it's 183 poles. So that rational function represents the solution to 10 digits of accuracy all the way up to the corners. And you can evaluate the rational function in 40 microseconds in Mount Lab. So we have a, a fast 10 digit accurate solution. We spent a lot of time playing around. And once again, for example, one of our built-in demos would be the isospectral drum. You want to see that? Toby Driscoll was the first person who did numerics with this shape, I think. Uh, and again, if you want to type in a number, you can get a random polygon. Uh, yes, I did. So every time I do this, I get another random polygon. Uh, that's a nicely symmetric one. What are the chances? <laughs> uh, nice root exponential convergence. 251 poles represents that to the default six digits. It took three quarters of a second to compute it. It takes 30 microseconds to evaluate the solution. Um, and of course, with the minus number, you can get circular polygons. These methods don't care what the shape of the region is, so long as it's analytic curves meeting at, at points. Um, so it doesn't have to be circular arcs, it could be anything. Let me show the other two examples. So first of all, a Helmholtz code, and this again would be the work with Abhi Gopal. So here you rather quickly find the solution and then it takes a while to plot it, but there's a typical scattering problem. If I give it a negative number, it takes as its input data, a point source instead of a plane wave. So here we're scattering from a point source. And then the work currently with Pablo Brubeck, uh, here's LDC stands for the lid driven cavity. So if I execute that, it will show you a Stokes flow in a lid driven cavity. Let's crank up the tolerance. Because with that higher degree of tolerance, you can see in the corner these things called Moffat vortices. Let's zoom in on that. Um, if I, there you can see that the, the contour, the, I'm afraid the grid isn't uh, fine enough for that to look very smooth, but the method is accurate to 10 digits and is resolving the first of this infinite sequence of Moffat vortices. In fact, you can see the beginning of the next one. Uh, similarly, if I say Stokes of step, you get a flow over a step. And again, you can see that nice Moffat vortex in the corner. This particular one was done on a finite domain with inflow and outflow conditions, but actually rational functions work on infinite domains too. So um, another variant, you can actually solve it directly on the infinite domain. Okay, that's the end of my demos. And let's get to the final bit of the talk. So just to remind you what we've done, first I spoke about free poles, AAA approximations. It's not yet bulletproof. We all hope we can find ways to make it bulletproof, uh, but we don't yet know how to do that. The fixed poles are bulletproof, but of course you have to know where to fix the poles. Um, in the particular case of certain problems with corner singularities, you can provably show that exponential clusterings are enough to give you root exponential convergence. Now, let me say, make some more remarks about the bigger picture of rational functions. So first of all, I want to uh, relate them to integral equations. And the connections are very close here. Um, another way to solve PDEs is with finite elements and the connections are not so close to that. But the link to integral equations is close. So suppose we have a Laplace problem, for example, on an L-shaped region. The integral equation approach to solving that, first of all, formulates the problem as an integral equation, and the unknown there will be a distribution of charge on the boundary. 
might be a single layer, a double layer, some mix of those things. But the unknown are functions on the boundary. There will be singularities involved, um, both in the integrals themselves and also at the corners. But a tremendous amount is known about how to handle those integrals with quadrature techniques. Then to evaluate the solution, once you've got the charge distributions, you use further integrals, uh, which again, uh, a lot is known about. Now, this is a big field. It's not as big as finite elements, but it's still very big. And I've listed here a number of the names. Remarkable things have been done by these people. It's just amazing how fast you can solve these problems. There's a demo by Hel Helsing and Ohala in Sweden have amazing demos online. Um, the real wizard these days of corner singularities is Kirill Serk, who knows everything about them. It's a, it's a very advanced field. Uh, and many of you know the group of Rockland and his colleagues at Yale and Greengard and his colleagues in Manhattan um, have done a lot of this work. Let's compare that with the lightning approach. So the picture is the point. You can see the lightning approach is not working on the boundary, but outside the boundary. Even though our problem domain is just the L shape, we're not trying to represent anything a priori on that boundary, but outside the boundary. So instead of looking for a uniquely determined distribution on the boundary, we're actually working in non-unique mode. In the, it's a redundant basis situation. We're just trying to do approximation with backslash. It doesn't precisely matter where you put the poles. They, still, they need to be exponentially clustered near singularities, but there's no precise place you have to put them because you're not trying to get a unique representation. Once you do that backslash, you have a rational function. So to evaluate it, you just evaluate. So there's no quadrature expertise is needed. This is a much younger field. There's, we don't have 30 geniuses who've worked on this problem uh, for the last 20 years. So the competition is not completely an even one. Um, but I think it's fascinating how simple the difference is between working on the boundary and working outside the boundary. Notice in this picture, um, you have this branch cut where the, the dominant singularity is there. And you can see the rational function have resolved that numerically. The yellow bit out here is caused by the smooth part of the problem, the polynomial part. And that's a familiar kind of picture related to Yentius theorem. There are also theorems by um, Walsh and Saf and Blatt and others. So I like to think of rational approximations as related to thinking beyond the boundary of a problem, which sometimes is a looser way to compute. You can be sloppier if you don't have to get it exactly right. If the real work is going on backstage and all you care about is what's happening on the stage, that gives you wonderful flexibility. And I think we're gonna see more of that in the years ahead. Uh, the final bit of philosophizing has to do with the question of what is a function? So let me very simplistically compare three different notions of a function. So the, in quotes, 19th century view of a function is analytic. Of course, the people in the 19th century knew about singularities, but their default assumption, if you like, was that a function would be analytic. Uh, of course, a lot of functions are like that, and Jebfun uh, takes great advantage of that. If you're working with smooth functions, you can use polynomials, you can get exponential convergence. It's, it is the base case without a doubt. Now, what I call the 20th century view, in a funny way, went to the other extreme. So if you think about what happened with mathematics, starting, of course, in the 19th century, people realized that not every function was analytic. And indeed, not every function was even continuous or differentiable. And with Weierstrassen and LeBague and others, this really moved to center stage in mathematics. And all of analysis was rebuilt on a completely non-smooth foundation. Measure theory was invented and so on and so on. And if you look at real analysis and ask what questions do people worry about in analysis? Well, it's, it's usually regularity. They wanna know how smooth is something. That is the core question of a lot of PDE theory and analysis. 
the numerical world has inevitably taken over a lot of that point of view. So there's no doubt that the dominant technology for solving uh, PDEs is finite elements, which works in this basis where you carefully quantify how smooth things are with double elements. So um, I might have called it the 21st century view, but that would, would be going a little too far. What I call the applied mathematics view is to take the view that functions are analytic except at isolated singularities. How can we exploit that? Because most problems that aren't truly analytic are like this. The only functions that look like this in the world to first approximation are the ones you get from Brownian motion, from random processes. But if you're not in the stochastic world, I think most functions are analytic apart from singularities. And that's why I think things related to, ran, to rational functions are so important. Okay, so that's the end of the philosophy. Now let me just finish. Um, first of all, to remind you that in a couple of hours, we have the second half of this exciting mini symposium. Thank you to the four speakers this morning. Um, this afternoon, we have these four talks and one of them is by me. I'm going to focus on exponential clustering of poles, but it all starts at two o'clock with Greg Belkin from Colorado. And then I wanted to make a closing remark, if I may. Related to the last four months of our lives. So uh, most of us are professional applied mathematicians or students of applied mathematics. Most of us spend most of our time doing mathematics in one form or another. And we've all had to change what we do a bit in the last four months in all sorts of ways. For many of us, it's been more pleasurable than we might have feared. There's been a lot of good as well as some bad. Um, we've had to confront the fact that most of us are not essential workers. Um, we're looking at the next century, not the next week. Um, so very few of us have been called into the office for emergency uh, work. We've been largely working at home doing our thing. On the other hand, I've reflected, and I'm sure many of you have reflected, how many friends we have around the world, as not just mathematicians, but as academics, we really are delocalized. We're connected with people everywhere at universities and labs around the world. We know people. And even the ones we don't know, if there's a reason, we can look them up pretty easily. So we have friends and potential friends everywhere. This was always true. You didn't need COVID-19 for that to be true. But certainly for me, it has made me realize more than ever what a wonderful aspect of the research life this is, that we have friends all around the world. Uh, let me thank you all once more. It's been the greatest honor of my life to get this award. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. And I know that everybody out there will join me in congratulating you again and thanking you for a beautiful talk. And I would say we have no uh, time for questions, but um, if, if I see a couple on the chat, uh, Nick would be happy to receive emails and answer your questions. Again, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Bye.